How are you doing today, Eric? Oh, I'm doing awesome. How are you? Pretty fabulous. Thanks very much. Let me start with the obligatory. Thank you for taking the time. Sure. No, I'm happy to be here. I know you're busy. So you can't see behind my um, green screen, but maybe you got a from my avatar. You could take a guess. Uh, I, you know, back here I have a shrine to the Adam West <laughs> Batman '66 TV show. So I, I'd like to know what show or what heroes inspired you as a young man that gave you the love or appreciation for this genre. Oh, um, it's interesting. The the stuff I was really into. Um, I was a comic book geek big time, um, probably more than any particular like superhero uh, show um, or movie. And um, it honestly, it wasn't uh, superhero comics. I was really into like Sandman and Hellblazer and I mean, Watchmen, I guess, if you could consider that as a superhero comic, but like, all those guys like Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore and frankly, Garth Ennis, uh, yeah. I was really obsessed by. Uh, Preacher was like totally, you know, totally life-changing for me. So it's like, I was into the medium, but I really gravitated towards the subversive stuff. Let me start, let's talk yeah. about, um, you know, I'm sorry, I got a lot of questions. I know we only got a little time. I might be Where rattling around a little bit. Yeah, but uh, let's talk about the boys presents diabolicals. Absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah. Did you see it? What you think? I love it. I love each and every one of them. It just completely blew my mind. Right? That's they're great. It's it's kind of like if you had the budget, maybe you could do that in the live action. Some of that stuff. But, <laughs> right. Um, how did this idea to expand the universe? How did that first come about? How when did you first conceive of this? Um, you know, you know, after the boys had become. Um, you know, a hit, thank God. Uh, we were amongst the, produ the producers were discussing, you know, what could be, uh, you know, good spin, uh, a good, the producers discussed what could be a good spin on. And, and we have, a, we had a couple ideas and, you know, we're, we're actually in pre-production on one. Um, but an idea that, you know, I always really loved was the idea of doing an animated anthology and 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 doing it as um, really like an incubator for boys' ideas because not you know you're not asking someone to commit to an entire series. You're just trying the wildest possible ideas you can try and 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 seeing if they work. I mean, I just sort of love experimenting. Um, and and it gave an opportunity to do that and then but and then cut to covid struck and, yeah. and we knew how long we were going to be off the air for and so we started to get pretty aggr aggressive about pitching it to amazon because we said um you know we're gonna be off the air for so long that we it'd be great to have a stopgap in there of something we can make um that can you know tide people over um, and obviously animation, you don't have to worry about being on set. You, everyone can do it at their, at their laptop. So Amazon bid on that idea and, you know, we were off to the races. Yeah. Keep those, keep the appetites wet a little bit for everybody. Trying, trying. Yeah. Right? Describe um, a little bit the process about who or, or how you chose who you wanted to reach out to for these ideas. Um, you know, we had a list of, of, you know, people we really loved and wanted to work with, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, bringing in Garth Ennis to, to write one so good. from the world of his books that isn't even the universe of the show at all, just his, totally his universe, was something I really wanted to do from the beginning because I came in to adapt these books from the first place. It's just a fan of Garth and, and what he had done in The Boys. I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of The Boys than almost anybody. So to be able to actually bring that world to life is, is a really giddy joy for, for me and, and Seth and Evan. Um, we really wanted to work with Justin Roiland because to me, Rick and Morty is among the best shows on television, period. Not just animated, not just comedy, just a truly amazing show. Um, and then, you know, and then a bunch of them were like, you know, Seth and Evan, 
uh, were reaching out to, uh, you know, some of their fancy Hollywood friends. And, you know, and I was really stunned to find how many people were actually fans of the boys and wanted to be involved. And then, and like brilliant people. I mean, you know, Andy Samberg and Aquafina. And it's just mind blowing to me, uh, Alana Glazer. And, um, and so we would meet with them and, and, and that really there was really no rule at all. It would just, you know, we would just say, what are, what story are you interested in telling and, and what style do you want it to be? And we just gave them the freedom to just completely run wild. Um, and I think that shows in, in the work. I think, you know, everyone went pretty crazy in, in the best possible way. Yeah, I, I think that adds a lot to it to have uh, the different stories and different styles. Does that help speed up the production of eight different stories so you can have them set to go? Um, no, it actually makes it a lot harder and more complicated um, because even though you have different styles and different people can be working on them in parallel, you know, and I'm new to the animation, uh, uh, Simon and Giancarlo, uh, who are the showrunner and director, like they really understand this world. I'm a, I'm a dilettante, I'm a, I'm a tourist. But from what I understand, what's very difficult is when you do a normal animation, you know, a, a regular show, you know, you're only signing off on one group of characters and one style and one group of, you know, backgrounds and worlds. Here we were doing eight eight different times, starting from scratch all over again. Okay. You know, even our homelanders had to be designed differently one to the other. Right, right. Um, and so it it actually ended up being like a ton more work, uh, but we thought it was worth it. I mean, again, we really wanted to do something that felt really unique. We're we're fans of the Animatrix and you know Star Wars Visions, and I just I really I think we all really wanted it to have just. A, each episode to be it's just completely you know unique work of art was there anybody that you reached out to or that that you wanted to get that was unavailable or or didn't want to do it um that you couldn't get no there i mean you know a couple people i i won't name uh i won't name any specific names but there were a couple people who were just busy and they couldn't do it um but uh with any luck there'll be a season two and we'll bring some of those people in and and you know, I would love to have this series be, you know, every single episode is done from someone totally different and totally crazy. Um, so hopefully uh, people will watch and we'll get to do more. You said you just asked them to tell what story there was no rules, whatever story they wanted to tell, they could make up their own characters, I guess. Did, did anybody present something to you? I mean, I can't imagine, but I feel like I got to ask Did anybody present anything. And you're like, oh, that's too much. You need to bring it, reel it in a little bit. Um, if we're willing to approve a character named Ranch Dressing Cum Squirter, I think that tells you that <laughs> right. there's, really, there's really nothing we're going to reject. Um, you know, we, we wanted, I mean, look, you know, we needed it to be tied into the universe somehow, usually either through the corporation Vought or Compound V. Um, but otherwise, and we needed the stories to be good. Like we were really interested, sure. you know, the one thing that I really love about the boys is I think it always takes people by surprise that it has substance and emotion um, and that we really care about getting that stuff right beyond the shocking moments. And, and I think the same is here. Like we wanted to make sure there was human emotion at the core of these stories and that there was something real going on and we weren't just you know being insane just to be insane and i think that helps um uh like even you know justin's short which is the, as insane as they get it, it's still about the those characters you know really trying to get some self-esteem right. um so you know like we always we, we wanted the stories to be really sharp um and have something to say but beyond that like we said use characters from the world or don't uh you know keep it any tone you want you know you're more you're more than welcome to do and a perfect example of that is like we 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 met with andy sandberg and obviously we were expecting him to pitch something funny and and he pitched you know i, I want to tell this 
really heartbreaking story about an yeah. elderly Korean couple where the wife is dying of cancer. And, and we were like, we took a beat and, and, and said, great, that sounds great, run with that ball. And, and just, you know, we know how fun it is to be able to experiment. So we wanted to give all the people who were gracious enough to work with us the, the all the freedom they wanted to experiment. A couple of times I'm leaning towards Justin's uh, pissed off superheroes kill their parents as probably the funniest one. And I know you can't pick a favorite, but did any of these episodes make you laugh more than any of the other one? I mean, they're, they're all wonderful. Um, I have a particular affection for Aquafina's about the sentient poo, because <laughs> from the beginning, we were like, we were writing it uh, and developing it as if it were E.T. Um, and that there was just this real connection between this little girl and her talking sentient shit. And um, it's just, it's a, and it's just, she wrote a really tight, sharp script. Like, you know, it's got a good arc. It, it wraps out in the sewer, which is the home of shit. It just, it, it all kind of comes together. So I actually love it as a piece of writing, um, but they're all great. Justin's blew me away. Uh, Simon's about the, the Homelander, uh, uh, you know, backstory. I mean, that's, that, that one is canon. I mean, that one is, you know, and and I and he didn't necessarily set out to write canon, but after reading the script and talking to him about it, I said, this this definitely happened in the universe. It's just it's that smart. So um, they're all wonderful in their own. And and the way that Seth and Evan could pull off an entire story without not without one word of dialogue. Um, that looks like my time. Let me bring this in for a a, a superhero landing, if I could, real quick. Uh, when you were a little kid, what was your favorite bowl of uh, Saturday morning cereal to eat while you were watching? <laughs> uh, the correct answer is half Cocoa Pebbles and half Peanut Butter Captain Crunch. Ooh, uh, interesting. Yeah, that is, it's, and people say to me, well, what about Reese's cereal? And I say, get the fuck out of there with this garbage. Like, <laughs> Cocoa Pebbles is the best chocolate cereal. Cap peanut Butter Captain Crunch is the best peanut butter cereal. Work with quality ingredients if you want a quality product. Right, right. Very great. Great answer. Great answer. Eric, thank you so much for your time. The Thanks. Boys Presents Diabolical premieres this Friday. Uh, and do me a favor. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you on the other side. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you so much. Yeah.